it about fire? Why do people find it so fascinating? Why does it elicit such strong emotions in us, like fear or desire, maybe even hope? My name is Jessica Thompson, and I'm Assistant Professor of Anthropology at Yale University in the United States. And I study the transformation of our species from one that was more embedded within its ecosystem to one that increasingly took control over its own evolution and began to engineer the world around them. How we ended up even expanding into all of the world's modern ecosystems and even beyond. Paleoscience is not just about reconstructing the past, but about predicting the future. We look to what happened before in long-term climate cycles to understand changes that we see in the present. We look to the evolution of other distantly related species to better understand what makes us unique now. We can use this information to know the magnitude of change that we might anticipate in what is yet to come. In some ways, what humans have done is unique, so very different from anything that has ever happened before that it is hard to imagine what a world would look like without us in it. For example, humans have been present in most of Earth's environments since the end of the last glacial cycle, the end of the last ice age. That means that the modern geological epoch, the Holocene, the climate as we know it now, has never existed without humans in it, as a part of it. Since about 12,000 years ago, that has been our reality. And as we transitioned fully into a food producing species rather than one that hunted and gathered, we've been living under very different conditions than the ones under which we evolved. That also means we have no modern benchmark for what most environments would be like without human influence under our current relatively warm conditions. And this makes us question the very concept of what it means to be natural. So what is it that humans do that is so different from other species? Well, amongst the many possible answers is engineering. We have not only used complex behavior, cooperation, and tools to engineer our own evolution, but also to transform the world around us. What do I mean by that? Well, starting with our earliest ancestors, it was our cooperative behavior that allowed us to raise more dependent offspring, siblings of different ages, than any other animal. And what that means is that through that cooperation, we can also extend the period of time that we are children. That period of time when we are learning all those crucial skills and complex behaviors that make us human. It also might have extended our lifespans as older generations began to contribute more and more to the well being of the rest of society. But it was our tool use that gave us the ability to adapt to new conditions within the span of a generation, rather than waiting around for biological evolution to help us adapt. It was all of these things that made other aspects of uniquely human culture possible. Things like art, religion, and even the ability to think about ourselves more deeply and our place in the world. Arguably, fire has been the most transformative of all of our tools. Although it's rare, there are some other species such as the so-called Australian fire hawks that do recognize the potential of fire to do things. They'll pick things up that have natural fire on them and drop them in new places to drive game. But they can't make fire, and they can't control fire. Since our earliest um, Homo erectus ancestors, one million years ago, we have been able to do that. And subsequent populations of human ancestors learned to make and deploy fire in ways that have really scaled up the speed and the magnitude at which we have been able to affect change in the world around us. This has been most notable with the recent transformation of most of the world's land surface into anthromes or human influenced biomes. Even supposedly wild places are not free from the long term footprint of human entanglement. Initially, 
Fire was used for things that might seem intuitive, like cooking and protection from predators, heat. But there's also evidence that fire was the catalyst for complex social interactions that took the human psyche into worlds that were not directly observable. There is evidence that hunter-gatherers spend their time around the fire talking about different kinds of topics than the ones that they spend talking about while they're out foraging. They talk about people who aren't present. They tell stories. Fire time is social time. And social time is crucial to the story of human success. Social cooperation was the key to human success. Fire has also long been used as a tool for the transformation of materials. As early as 70,000 years ago on the southern coast of Africa, we know that people were using fire to transform stone into, to, to change the material properties of it into ones that were more malleable and could be used to shape tools into the, into the kinds that they desired. And in many parts of the world, as early as 30,000 years ago, fire was used to harden clay into shapes that could be used for spiritual or religious purposes. This was before we see fire being used to make clay into things like pottery, more utilitarian, but also essential for human survival later on because it was through storage containers such as this that it really was able to transform the way we could carry food and store food. And this in turn transformed our ability to develop the large urban centers that we all know about in the ancient world. Without fire, they never would have existed. By 5,000 years ago, again in multiple parts of the world and at different times, we see that people were using fire to extract liquid metal from raw ore to shape new tools which they used for farming and for making war. It was later that we began to alloy them together to form new kinds of blends with new potential to create new things. And even today, we still recognize fire as an important tool for making steam, coal, and other things that are important to human life. Our early ancestors recognized this potential and they harnessed it in a way that engineered our own evolution. So let's look at how early modern humans actually used fire to change the world around them. Our research group has found that in Southern Central Africa, the place where many of us have all of our ancestry, Humans were using fire to shape ecosystems, to manage them. What they would do is light small targeted patches of fire. They would control it. And that puts everything at a different point in time in its succession, meaning that you can have a patch of grass there, a bit of bush over here, larger trees with a closed canopy in another place, all nearby, providing all the resources that a hunter-gatherer would need. There's even evidence that Neanderthals in Germany were doing this 130,000 years ago. And if that's the case, then this kind of behavior, this strategic shaping of environments is ancient knowledge indeed. And what we have to do when we think about this is wonder, what does this mean for what it is that people do today? And if we look around us, it's easy to see that in fact, these are strategies that are being deployed by indigenous people even now. Such use of fire to manage ecosystems is also something that modern conservationists and wildlife managers use. This is people who came to the realization a bit later that fire doesn't have to be a destructive tool. It can also be used as a tool for shaping and transforming and molding without destroying. And targeted burns, as we know, they can offer control over ecosystems. They can reduce the frequency of destructive fires, and they can help things along in their regeneration cycle. Interfering with that cycle by stopping fires that occur naturally, that can actually create more problems than it solves. 
Indigenous groups were well aware of this potential, and they have been employing strategies like this for millennia, even here in these forests that we see around me. This is well aligned with the scientific goals of people who wish to reduce the scale of wildfires, promote ecosystem diversity, and also maintain the habitats of taxa that have adapted to these frequent burning events. It's in our best interest to learn from records of paleo fire, from archeology span and from oral history and indigenous knowledge in order to understand how these past ecosystems were maintained and their recent evolution so that we can continue to live sustainably within them. We could have taken a page from this indigenous knowledge a long time ago in modern conservation efforts, but now we can. We can understand how humans can live more sustainably within nature rather than outside of it. Maybe the first step to this is recognizing that maybe humans are not something totally separate after all. There's some important lessons here. We have a very peculiar notion of wilderness, a place that is entirely without human imprint. When in reality, when we look at the paleo record, we can see that that has not been the case for a very, very long time. Humans and human ancestors have been living within and changing ecosystems for millennia. And maybe it's actually more unnatural to completely remove people from an ecosystem altogether. Maybe if we can recognize how to do this sustainably, we can have some hope that we can move forward within a more sustainable balance after all. Crucial to moving forward, we must be more inclusive in our search for solutions. People who are living at the margins of preserves and other conserved areas, they have to be included in these decisions. They have to be at the table of decision-making, not left standing outside the fences. We have to continue to recognize that humans do have enormous destructive power. Our powers of cooperation, coupled with our ability to shape and transform materials, material properties, and make new ones, that has really given us a lot of control and a lot of potential impact on everything. But at the same time, these abilities and tools are also our key to a more sustainable future. By coming together and engineering solutions to some of the same problems we might have arguably caused, well, we really can envision a road forward. Taking that is going to require a scale of international cooperation for which we uniquely as a species actually have the potential, but we haven't yet seen it realized. So digging into the past has uh, surprising revelations about the present and about our potential futures. This is something we should always hold in our minds, the plurality of the potential futures in front of us. We can choose our path. After seeing through paleoscience the millions of years that we have spent engineering our own evolution, we should have confidence that we really do have the ability to determine our own fates. We can use all these unique adaptations that we have to decide how to best live maybe within nature rather than outside of it. We can accept that we are a part of it. We can imagine how to become a part of it more sustainably and more inclusively. And we can also accept the responsibility that our own knowledge about that gives us to shape our environments in a way that benefits not only humans, really, but all life on Earth. Thank you very much.